Welcome to the Silicon Valley Podcast with your host, Sean Flynn, who interviews famous entrepreneurs, venture capitalists, and leaders in tech. Learn their secrets and see tomorrow's world today. Monty, I'm excited for today. Thank you for taking the time to be on the Silicon Valley Podcast. Now, our audience, well, I've done a lot of research on your background. It's amazing. But for our audience, can you give a little background of your career up until this point? So I'm excited to be part here of the Silicon Valley podcast. And so my name is Monty Metzger. I'm German born entrepreneur by heart. I started in the late nineties developing websites out of um, my first uh, Mac computers had been working on, on Mac since, since uh, I started on it, but uh, I'd been in the digital business since then. I had started, um, I think, more than 10 companies now, some uh, more successful, some less successful. But uh, overall, I'd been in the digital space um, since the kind of the early days. And so I started another company in early 2000, which grew to 100 people with offices in New York City with a partner in New York. Uh, in Germany, then we expanded to Beijing and Tokyo, and I sold. I got uh, lucky to sold sell the company and then start to become a business angel, where I invested and co-invested a lot with Silicon Valley investors as well. Um, this company was called Digital Leaders Ventures. Then later on, and we incorporated a, a regulated venture fund. And 2013, I discovered Bitcoin already and uh, met my friend Adam Draper in San Mateo. And we spoke about this uh, Silk Road Bitcoin auction, which had been happening. And then he and his father, Tim, um, bought these 20,000 Bitcoin during that day. And it was very exciting to follow that. But this was the time when I learned about Bitcoin and when I learned about blockchain and everything. But I um, did not go all in during that time yet, because as you know, Bitcoin had been at $1,000 during the time it dropped 2014 to 100. So everybody thought, well, that's kind of uh, not as interesting as, as it looked like. But eventually, um, a couple of years later, I rediscovered it because um, we wanted to do more of the investments out of uh, Digital Leaders Ventures, but we could not do it as a ve regulated venture fund. There was no infrastructure. There was no laws around it. We talked with the regulators and they didn't have a clue. But then there was a, a small country in Europe called Liechtenstein, which is probably one hour drive from Zurich airport. So landlocked between Germany and uh, and uh, Switzerland. And um, Liechtenstein has come up with a new law, a new framework called the Blockchain Act, which is laying out the foundation of um, uh, blockchain regulation. And this excited me so much that I decided to resign as a general partner and said, now it's the time to go all in crypto. And um, so we moved with, uh, with my family all uh, to Crypto Valley, uh, where I'm at the moment. And from there on, we incorporated a new company called LCX. I mean, most of, at least my eyes, probably this is the first time they've actually heard of Liechtenstein. What you just said is pretty incredible. Can you go a little bit deeper in what's happening there right now that the world should know about? For me, Liechtenstein is the most exciting jurisdiction for cryptocurrency and blockchain overall. The key reason is that they took a holistic view on regulation. And first of all, it's a lightweight legal framework, which gives entrepreneurs like us a good way to breathe and to be innovative while having legal clarity on the background. And when, when I say legal clarity, I mean that it's not regulating one piece of the puzzle only, but the whole value chain of blockchain and crypto tokens from the, uh, so there are different roles in there. Um, LCX acquired or got approved for eight registrations under the Blockchain Act. Uh, that's more than any other company in the country. And for example, in our situation, we are a token generator. So we are creating, we are, the, the token is born in a way, then you need to hold it. So the whole custody roles um, are regulated and, and part of the regulation as well. Um, and it goes to trading, price services, identity service providers, and so on. So there are different 
roles where I can talk um, later also a little bit deeper about it. But it, it's this holistic approach really alongside the value chain, which makes it very, very unique. And therefore, it's the perfect playground for us to enter the European market out of this little country uh, and then go all over Europe immediately with um, kind of the European economic area where Liechtenstein is part of. And you had said LCX. I'm guessing that means Liechtenstein Exchange. Is that correct? That's right. So LCX stands for Liechtenstein Cryptocurrency Exchange. Uh, we are lucky to got uh, LCX.com and we have at LCX on Twitter. So of course, the whole branding and everything is also important for us. And we th thought uh, also to start something with a global mindset immediately while operating out of this little country in Europe. So why do you think Liechtenstein is so open, so progressive when it comes to fintech? Well, Liechtenstein had always been a financial powerhouse. It's, uh, uh, probably as you uh, are aware of, Liechtenstein has the highest GDP in the world. Uh, I think 260,000 per capita, uh, even higher than Switzerland. But normally, as it's a small country, it's just mixed up with the Swiss data very often. But if you look separate it, that's incredible. Then a lot of foundations had been there or are there. So IKEA Foundation is uh, headquartered in Liechtenstein. Then a lot of oligarchs, uh, Russian oligarch and family offices or even venture funds are based in Liechtenstein. So it is a financial powerhouse. And within the last 20 years, it shifted from, from kind of a European um, tax haven into a highly regulated and transparent uh, manner as well. So probably in the 80s, it was known to be uh, more a, a tax haven. Now it's really turned upside down and it became... Um, it got a triple A rating at Standard Poor's. That's the highest rating a country can get. So very, very high reputation. And they're trying to protect it a lot as well, which makes us um, kind of a hard daily life because they are asking a lot of questions. They go really deep in trying to understand our business. And it's not just uh, kind of a you pay something, you get a, a registration or license. It's really a lot of work to get it and then to maintain it as well. So talking about crypto, what are some of the big possibilities of crypto? Kind of what's already been imagined? What's happening now in the space? So let me step a, um, probably two steps back. Um, giving my background of being a futurist and a trend scout in terms of the latest and greatest technologies, I've seen a lot of things happening in the past 25 years. Um, so I remember when mobile internet was coming. So we hired a team and we opened the office in, in Tokyo to find out about iMode, latest feature phones. Uh, then we um, hired some students at Philadelphia University, at Harvard University to send us screenshots of this new, the Facebook <laughs> social media website, um, which was in 2007. And um, so with the, all these technology trends, we've seen fades, uh, hypes, a lot, but other very fundamental technologies as well. And when I looked at blockchain I, and Bitcoin and all these cryptocurrencies there, I discovered that this is really a fundamental technology. It's here to stay and it will disrupt a lot of industries we, which we can't even imagine of. And this technology development can't be taken away from us anymore. So it's here in the market. And now it's about when adoption or when this disruption will happen. But it's not the question about if, it's only when. So, and especially when I look at the financial markets, there's the biggest and the kind of uh, immediate opportunities there, because in my belief, blockchain is to the money, what email was to the letter. So it's really a fundamental shift where we're what's called the web three is coming. So it's the next evolution of the internet. So, and in the first age or era of the internet, we had the internet of information. So we could send a letter uh, quickly from A to B with an email. And then we are using WhatsApp or like other social media or, or messenger systems to make it even faster. But it's all about sharing data and information. Now, the Web3 is all about 
the Internet of Value. So as easy as sending an email, you can now send money from Liechtenstein to Silicon Valley or to Venezuela, Turkey or whatever you want. And that's really revolutionizing all businesses globally, but as a first start to the financial and capital markets. So everything that can be tokenized will be tokenized. It's just a matter of time. So how far along are we in this when it comes to the financial markets and blockchain and cryptocurrency? It still is the early days because everybody who's tested it and find out realized it's complex, you know, installing MetaMask, these wallets, uh, you have private keys um, to enable your wallets, then you have different service providers to jump on. It, it's still kind of a complex system. And this reminds me of the early days of the internet when you needed to, to explain what is a browser, how to type in the address, you know, these very basic things everybody is now used to, but now it's with Web3 and the Internet of Value is very similar. So there are things where you need to explain what is a public address, how you to use it, why is it more transparent than any financial bank account or something like that? What are the implications around the different the different blockchains and pros and cons and, and so far? So it feels like um, still the early days. And that's why we also at LCX really think long-term. Uh, we have a five and 10 year plan of, of the company as well. Uh, while we want to get some kind of immediate uh, actions and exciting projects out of the door uh, right now as well. So it's uh, having the uh, kind of a long-term view and short-term actions. Monty, I'm amazed when you're saying five, 10 years. I mean, most people here think six months, maybe a year at most, but with that, you also mentioned Web 3.0. Our listeners, we we covered a little bit about that with an interview with Ari Newman. Uh, if we go back in our archives to check that out. But really, how does Web 3.0 really tie all this together? Well, when I'm talking about Web 3, it's all about decentralized internet and um, in particular, in our case, decentralized finance, which means the web really becomes decentralized in terms of how how it's operating, how economics work there, and how data is stored and validated also. And that's uh, like what, what blockchain is all about. I mean, the best example is in the internet of information, if you send a file, like I have a picture here and I'm sending you to this, to you, you have a duplicate of this JPEG of this image right in your inbox. But if you, I'm sending $50, I don't want you to have a duplicate. It would be good business, <laughs> but then uh, it's not what money is all about. You want um, to solve this double spend problem. And um, with the different validators in the blockchain and uh, all these node operators, which are validating these data in these decentralized networks, you are actually enabling this. And this is why, that's why you can um, transfer assets um, which are on the blockchain like NFTs, or you can send Ethereum, USD, coin, or, or other things as easy as sending an email. We're definitely going to have to have a few questions later about nfts but before that i've heard the term internet of value what does that mean to you is that what we're already covering a little bit or, or what where does this come in for me the internet of value is really a global revolution where the power of financial and capital markets is shifted and there are different dynamics which we currently see but uh, let me give you a very simple example. I mean, I've been a technologist and in the digital markets for many years, and I've been doing a lot of speeches as well. So when I had been speaking about cloud computing or AI or this I mode mobile internet, I'd been invited by directors of companies or head of um, different departments in doing digitalization or digital transformation. But when I dived into blockchain and, and Bitcoin, learned more about this and did talks about it, it shifted because then I was suddenly invited by head of states, a whole government. I was sitting next to a foreign minister and the um, bank of, for example, I was in Oman. There was the bank of Oman. The CEO was there sitting there next to me. So it was a complete different 
um, set of people interested in the space. And, and the reason is that when you talk about money, you talk about money, uh, power, you talk about uh, sovereignty of a, of a state, you talk about um, like different currencies and what is money at all and all these things. And I um, had like all different kind of experiences around it, but the, the um, overall impact is much, much deeper. I'll give you give you another example. I was speaking at a Russian bank, for example. Over, they invited me to Moscow, so I flew to Moscow. I had a nice hotel overlooking the the Red Square there, and then I went to this uh, meeting room in the hotel. And there were like fifty bankers, and there was a, a team of uh, innovation. Uh, I think within an innovation team within the bank who invited me and I started to talk about internet value and Bitcoin and blockchain and all these, the kind of things which are happening. And then some people stood up and said, that's all bullshit <laughs> and jumped up. And, and then, then they started to switch in Russian and, and it was like almost a fight was going on because it's so emotional, you know, it, it is, it's disrupting so many um, middleman business models it's it's like risking uh, the the power of a of a financial institution or at least changing or really disrupting um their businesses and i i mean that's what we've seen with um digital information and documents with the internet of of information as well that a lot of middlemen had been cut out and that's what's happening with the Internet of Value and Web3 as well. So for me, it's really the start of a big transformation over the next decades, really. So I can visualize right now the people standing up and cursing at you and yelling. Over time, since you know your first experience with, with Bitcoin to now, are these people starting to open up more? Or are there still a lot of pushback? And at what level is it the banks, the government, where are you having the most open conversations? We're trying to have open conversations on all levels from regulatory side to policy makers, to uh, industry partners, other crypto exchanges or, or blockchains or anything like that. But, and, and we've seen a transformation on all levels. Let, let me give you another example here. Uh, we had been part of a working group with the World Economic Forum, you know, these fancy Davos conferences, but they also do during the year a lot of sessions. So we held a session in Singapore with 15 central banks. Um, we were the only external company besides the, the central bankers. So I prepared a similar talk, like talking to you about internet value and what's it all about. But they cut me off and said, okay, we well, you know all this. Yeah, let's dive deeper. So, and, and surprising for me is really that the knowledge the central bankers, for example, have about it or the International Monetary Fund goes really, really deep into the topic. So the Swiss National Bank has a working group. Um, the IMF has even published a lot of very deep insights reports about blockchain, about centralized uh, digital uh, central bank digital currencies, CBDCs, and all kind of implications about monetary flows. So they know a lot about it. That was very surprising to me. Where I do see a lack is with... Um, or like still where it needs some time is all the kind of mid-sized bankers, uh, banks or financial institutions who are smaller, who don't have like the, the money to fund uh, R&D teams around this topic. So they're falling behind a little bit, but that's an opportunity for a lot of new uh, uh, startups or uh, companies who are tipping their toe into these markets and say like we have something much more innovative much cheaper and better where you can open up uh, something similar like a bank account so the conversation now it sounds like everyone is so much more knowledgeable of the crypto space from the conversations i'm kind of wondering have you heard of anything where maybe in the future they they open everything up to crypto and then close it to put their digital currency in these governments or countries or has any conversation come up with kind of roadmaps in the future for the governments that are have currencies that are more established yes so when we talk about the central bank digital currencies there had been a lot of um, projects being published around testing it so uh, a few central banks had done 
technical trials or tests. But I think the Chinese government really is meaning it seriously. So there you you can go into different cities like Shenzhen and actually seeing it in action. So people can actually use this uh, digital yuan over there, paying their bills. Um, then there are fees deducted uh, directly from your digital wallet and all these things. So there it's being introduced step by step. And obviously also for the, the Chinese regime, it's a dream come true because they can then control all monetary flows within the country. So I think there are the good things and, and bad things about this. But in general, the, there's a currency war uh, going on at the moment. It's about shifting the kind of fiat money into a digital world. That's why the discussion which is going on about the digital dollar in the US is so important. But as it seems now is that between the US and uh, China as kind of the two powerhouses, there is Europe, which at the first time is actually taking a leap uh, and, and it has some advantages or a lot of advantages, I would even say, um, uh, among uh, Silicon Valley. Um, and started out to create this crypto value. In crypto value, in, I would say, Liechtenstein and the whole Zook area, there are now more than 1,000 different blockchain companies. They're from entrepreneurs all over the world. And it's the first time that I'm here standing in the, in the middle of the whole movement. And it's not happening in Silicon Valley this time. It's happening here. It's happening with these outstanding billion-dollar uh, blockchain companies who've created tokens, which everybody laughed about at the beginning, and are now, uh, yeah, making more money than any uh, bank could dream about. Speaking about laughing and making more money than anyone could dream about, could you go into a little history of NFTs and this current craze? Is there any substance to it? I do see the NFT, so non fungible tokens, as a substantial evolution of assets on the blockchain. The unique thing about an NFT is really that there's only one of it uh, in the world. So this non-fungible tokens uh, compared to fungible tokens. So for example, just to explain to your audience, if you have one dollar bill, you want to have all the dollar bills the, looking the same. So these are fungible. They're all kind of looking the same, have the same functionality. But if you have one art piece by Picasso, then that's the, the only one hand drawn with a signature. That's the, the one piece you don't want a thousand copies of it. This would dilute the value. So for some assets, NFTs make total sense. And it, it's not nothing new. I mean, there'd been crypto kitties there since years. We looked at this. This is it's a different standard to the Ethereum blockchain, for example, the ERC721. Um, most tokens or many tokens are ESC20s, and this is like a different smart contract, which makes sure that within this code uh, on the blockchain, there's only one piece there out. And what we've seen now and all this craziness in the art space is that there have been creative people um, creating digital art or artworks or tokenizing um, pictures or, or specific drawings or something like that and then selling it. And of course, now the, the big art um, auction houses had been jumping on it as well. So we've seen some some craziness going on over there. I'm not sure how sustainable this is. I'm, I'm not an art collector and I'm not an art insider, but I do see it. the technology itself can be used on a lot of things which are non-fungible as well. So at LCX, we thought about a similar project and we are now taking diamonds, uh, which are also non-fungible. So each diamond has uh, a unique GIA number, a certificate number, it has this different size and there's only one diamond like this in the world. So we thought that's perfect. So we're taking this into the NFT space and we're tokenizing it. So that's what we call the diamonds project. So tokenized diamonds. And it's um, yeah, just been launched at, at diamonds.com where you can now buy some tokenized diamonds and and they become an owner of a of a virtual asset backed uh, NFT. So you mentioned tokenizing diamonds, but what other assets can be tokenized? What are we about to see in that that space? 
In general, I believe that everything that can be tokenized will be tokenized. Some things don't make sense, will still be tokenized. Some other things will have big, big impact on, on the economy. So we've seen wine bottles, rare wine bottles being tokenized, art pieces, like even uh, either individual art pieces put into one NFT or split up. So you could have one piece of this Picasso painting, for example. Um, and then there are also other like more um, uh, financial products like uh, derivatives, bonds, um, tokenized real estate, tokenized uh, IP rights. We're also experimenting around patents, for example, that you could have uh, patent trading or um, even carbon credits, which uh, had been so analog for the, the last couple of years, which are now taking onto the blockchain, making it uh, a tradable asset. And then you have to decide if this makes sense to be an NFT as a code or really, or, or some other form of a token. That's interesting. And this NFT space, this token space and, and all that, how important are the crypto exchanges to everything, to this ecosystem? Well, when I looked at the market back in 2017 and um, actually had been spending six weeks during summer in Silicon Valley, meeting a couple of influential tech entrepreneurs and investors, I'd been speaking a lot about the impact of blockchain technology and what's really important to build now. And so there, there are a couple of building blocks. Uh, one is these blockchains or public chains, which you see like Ethereum, Cardano, or Bitcoin networks. Uh, these are fundamental kind of building the, the, the blockchain where you can build applications on top. Then the, the other element is exchanges, where this, as a key infrastructure layer, you're enabling trade, going from one asset to the other. Uh, and I think these market players as an exchange is a crucial part. And that's why we decided to go into this element rather than building another Ethereum competitor, we decided to build this out. And I think exchanges itself or trading platforms as a whole will be a crucial element like AOL in the back in the days or CompuServe when you the, the connecting you to the internet, the exchanges will be key service providers. And there are different kinds of exchanges. There are centralized exchanges where you as a user can expect like a full service similar to going to um, uh, like a, a service provider, a financial service provider who uh, enables you to uh, get kind of an easy user experience, but uh, also ways to recover your access or if you lost your password, you get ways to access it again. But you also, it is as a called centralized exchange, it's a centralized entity which enables these users to trade uh, at very low fees. So at LCX also, it's like instant settlement, very low fees. And then there are on-chain exchanges now, um, which are growing quite rapidly as well. These are decentralized exchanges. The key difference is that every participant, every user is his own manager of his keys. So if if you, for example, there, um, you're creating a, your wallet and you're trading on decentralized exchanges, you are responsible as a user on your own codes, on your passwords. If you lose these passwords, you probably lose access to the to your whole funds. So it's, it's creating more responsibility, um, but in, in a way, uh, uh, yeah, kind of a, in also a very innovative space. So there's a centralized exchanges and decentralized exchange, exchanges. Both are super, super important and a big uh, element of the future of uh, any trading. And there, I'm probably uh, regarding to your question, NFTs are a key part of this. Um, so whether you're selling um, several tokens or NFTs, it will be always on a marketplace of, of, of some space. These marketplaces, whether they're decentralized or centralized, uh, I'm guessing decentralized regulators are not involved in that industry, but those centralized ones, or, or correct me if I'm wrong, but the centralized ones, how are they regulating the industry? What direction are they pushing things? Well, we, we have been in this discussion now for years. So um, since like four years ago, we started 
uh, working with uh, different policymakers and governments around this regulation. And now, again, discussing deeply about decentralized platforms as well. In, in general, there are, a, like, the market is maturing. And it needs to become also a more safe place for users because a lot of the platforms which you now used to um, use or um, which you currently, if you look at the, the cryptocurrency space, there are a lot of unknowns. So you don't know really who the team is. You don't know where the company is or they're somewhere offshore. There's no security. And this is all about what regulators want. Uh, they want to create investor protection. So, and this is something which we embrace and we say like, we want every investor or every participant there that they know what they are investing in and then they can like make their own schedule in terms of risk level and say like, okay, I want to go the risky way or not, but at least they are fully informed what we, uh, so that's why we're embracing this thought about investor protection. And um, what regulators also sometimes also do is of course, um, kind of slowing things down and then kind of making barriers of innovation and, and, and kind of creating this innovation dilemma, which is not so good. So this is something which we're trying to overcome and say, okay, we actually need innovation and you need to be brave sometimes to make that happen but in, a, in a, a regulated environment. And then, um, so out of these, elements there are now also happening uh, a big discussion about decentralized platforms and there are also have a kind of a balanced view on things because some of these so-called decentralized platforms are not so decentralized there there's some which are really are with tens of thousands of validators and actors but some are basically that has the vision of a decentralized platform but it comes down to a few servers and 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 the hands of, of of people so they're not really that decentralized and then um the question also occurs in terms of regulatory oversight is how like they claim to be decentralized but it's actually like 10 people crew and a few servers so it's it's not really, but and, and, and there, like if there's a hack happening or if there's some problems there, I, I don't think you can't, um, you can hide on the long term, just saying we are a decentralized platform. Well, it's actually not. Um, so I think there, there you have to take a balanced view between the technology innovation and um, security and uh, kind of policy makers there. Speaking about hiding and policy makers and that, what about? tax evasion what about kyc know your customer all these concerns and money laundering and scams how how does this with all the exchanges and the sector as a whole how does it all play play together play a part in general these things are important if you're acting in the financial markets these things are necessary because um like they had been there since decades, introduced now to make our world a little safer, to make transparency, uh, bring transparency in the markets. And actually with blockchain, there's more transparency, probably more than you want, because if you're holding a wallet and then you disclose it, that it's yours, everybody can see what's going in and out. There are blockchain analytics um, and deep like blockchain tools where you can go in all different transactions and you can funnel where the funds come from. So you have much more transparency than any time before. And so talking about these things like know your customer, I think it's a necessary element, but it's also an opportunity for a lot of startups because um, for example, at LCX, you sign up once and then you can use a lot of tools. We have a DeFi platform, a DEX aggregator called Fire Salamander. We have the centralized exchange, LCX exchange. We have now Timons. We have interesting token sales, which are launched in a compliant manner of our platform. And for all these things, you just need to sign up once, get verified, and then you don't need to do this on like many, many times. But here we have very strict standards. We are uh, like Liechtenstein is known to be um, very strict in that in that regard. So we are already, I would say, um, ready to also conquer other markets like US or Singapore or, or something like that, because um, I think we're a little bit uh, stricter than than in these countries already. Speaking of countries, 
I mean, right now, Liechtenstein sounds like a lot's happening there with engineers, the government, investors, all combined and all collected into one area. Are there other areas of the world, whether it's Europe, whether it's Asia, whether there's the U.S., that you're really seeing these pockets where everything is happening? Absolutely. So talking about technology hubs had been my passion for the last 15 years, traveling also to these. So I've been to Silicon Valley many times, Tokyo, Shen, Shenzhen, Shanghai, like the Asian ones. And, and of course, also European. I mean, a lot of the European unicorns coming from Northern Europe, um, from Sweden, you know, Spotify, for example, um, Skype as well so there are technology hubs out there and what is shifting now a little bit is that this decentralized web and web 3.0 is also shifting balances there so we do see really global engagement and that's what's making it so fascinating because you can't think in jurisdictions or countries anymore which makes it very complicated for governments to regulate or to um, talk about these these startups if they're really global and what I've seen, there are like um, different players at the moment. So the early winners, the um, let's say the MySpaces and uh, Friendsters of the of the world, so the first generation of of platforms, who had been innovative, but they really avoid any type of uh, regulatory foresight. They pretend to um, do like simple KYC and everything, but they're kind of fleeing also from country to country um, to avoid these, um, these things, but they're doing good business uh, still, but uh, pressure will be increased. And then there are companies like uh, Coinbase, Kraken or LCX.com, where we are really embracing this trying to work with the regulators and trying to go um, uh, finding solutions where uh, we get a kind of a good approach of balancing innovation and, and regulation. And in, in terms of the technology hubs, I mean, where does it come from? I always said, I think I'm sitting here in the, in the middle of the crypto universe at the moment. So Europe is really leading the pace in terms of uh, this crypto valley um, companies uh, like Ethereum, Tezos, um, here LCX um, are here. Then these are, you know, Ethereum are oh, public blockchains, but then there are no new banks opening, like blockchain banks, uh, Seba, Signum, uh, for example, in Switzerland, who are really doing innovative stuff over here. Um, and then and from the outside, it's driven by excitement from Asia and from the US. And I think US at the moment is clearly lacking behind and is also shying away a lot of smart entrepreneurs. Some are sitting in Silicon Valley, but they've ac actually incorporated in, in Europe. Good example is Zappo, for example, Zappo.com, a smart entrepreneurial team from um, here at an office in University Avenue in the heart of Silicon Valley. But the, the, the company is actually Gibraltar and, and Switzerland based. Um, so it, yeah, like if regulation will not um, pick up in the US, um, the, a lot of the businesses will will flee the country. Yeah, I can honestly say I already know a couple of buddies that have moved to Puerto Rico, that have moved overseas, uh, taken their you know their engineering talent with them to you know set up operations in more friendly environments. So with that, I mean, right now everything in crypto, at least for the last you know year. It's all been great news. Everything is positive. What happens if there's another crypto winter? What would happen to the industry? What would happen to the players if that, that took place? Well, there, there might be a next uh, crypto winter coming. And I do remember the story, or I told you that 2014 Bitcoin price fell from $1,000 to $100. And for me, it was really the crypto winter thought uh, this, this is not going to start really. But now when you look at these um, volatile markets, uh, first of all, Bitcoin itself has reached such a powerful outreach in terms of supporters that this won't go away and um, there will always be support on the on kind of a Bitcoin as a, as a digital gold, as an investment, yeah, as a new asset class. And then there are the other things where different blockchains and tokens um, will remain. And I'm not looking at the 
prices all the time. I'm, I'm not a trader myself. I do see it really on the long term. And what is for sure is this blockchain technology and cryptocurrencies tokens are revolutionizing the digital industry. And this can't be taken away. So even if there's another crypto winter and the, like the assets value might go down, the innovation will continue. But what I'm not sure is if the first generation of these assets and, and technology solutions will remain. Because I've seen also these MySpace and Friendster platforms who had been then taken over by Facebook and Snapchat and, and others. Similar to, you know, AOL and CompuServe, there, there are different generations and only uh, a few companies really make it through all of these um, kind of different technology evolutions. But what we now see, like in 2008, since the Satoshi Nakamoto white paper had been coming out, 2009, kind of first implementation. So within the first 10 years, it had been uh, kind of the Wild West. But um, now it turns to be the kind of evolution of Wild West. You know, Wild West uh, also means the freedom of innovation, creating first rules. Um, during the time, new institutions had been launched. Um, and that's the, the similar happening right now. So the, the infrastructure has been created. And I'm a true believer that this infrastructure of a trading venue like LCX is essential. So uh, issuing tokens in a compliant manner, what we're currently doing with exciting projects, uh, one is called DigiCorp Labs, for example, where we did an, a regulated token sale now, um, and now others coming up, is essential. It, is, it, it feels like the Goldman Sachs of crypto. And Monty, you've been around, I mean, you mentioned 2014 to now in the crypto space. When I go online, when I type in YouTube, blockchain, Bitcoin, you get a lot of these media hype people kind of, I almost don't want to say crazy. Some of them, what are the insiders, people like you that are in the space? What do you, what do you guys, what's the view of some of these over the top people on YouTube and other social media platforms when they talk about Bitcoin, when they talk about blockchain, what are your thoughts on them? I sometimes think they're they're all crazy and also uh, kind of living the dream as an influencer, um, traveling from A to B in private jets, throwing around with money. But it's reflecting our society on so many levels. Also, kind of this Instagram influencers who like never had a job before and suddenly are getting sponsored to travel or to use these products or something like that. So there, it's an evolution of our society in a way. And that's reflected also with these new uh, digital coins or projects which are then pushed. But if you're like for your audience, I think it's important to get a deeper understanding about it. There are also very good um, YouTube sessions on there from, from MIT or, or Harvard professors talking about the deep implication. One of our advisors is Don Tapscott, for example, who got this famous TED talk about blockchain. So if you listen to Don, you really get a deep understanding about or like a good overview about blockchain. Then we had another um, advisor from Stanford University, um, professor who had been talking about in math we trust you know the blockchain networks are really trust networks that's why in Liechtenstein for example it's called trusted technology so the actually blockchain act is called trusted technology law um, in, in this regard so uh, there you find plenty of very insightful and good content and it even goes up to central bankers or the IMF, Christine Lagarde talking about uh, blockchain and cryptocurrencies. It's really taking kind of this uh, analog money into a digital world now with digital money. Speaking of individuals or companies and media, who are some of the crypto blockchain fintech in that space, people or companies that are on the rise that other than uh, LCX, which you know we'll definitely we we know is going to be here. What other ones out there should we know about? Which other ones should we pay attention to in the coming years? For for me, it's hard to talk about other competitors or or partners um, companies in the market as I don't have all the insights. But if you look at the market as a whole, 
uh, there are different categories which you have to look at. So one bucket is really these blockchains itself. So there's there's Bitcoin as kind of the fundamental digital gold, but the blockchain itself is very slow. It's it's not so scalable, so it needs different other solutions. Then there's Ethereum as a blockchain which enables first time smart contracts. So you can it's programmable money, so you can program some things into digital financial products, which is exciting. And then there are not new, a lot of new rivals from Solana to Avalanche to Cardano who like want to beat uh, Ethereum on so many levels. So that's, these are, these are the blockchains. Then there are the infrastructure players. A lot of these mining companies who are mining Bitcoin or mining other tokens or staking companies now who are super highly profitable, who are um, part of this um, proof of stake blockchains where you need to put some some of the tokens on a side to X to gain extra rewards on it. So um, they're, they're creating high yield and good returns. Then there are these um B2C or even B2B uh, market makers or market platforms like like LCX, where I, I would count Coinbase or Kraken also as a as a key player there, uh, who are enabling trade. Um, and then there's, um, I would think these are the three most important infrastructures if you look at the markets. And then there are a lot of innovation things like from DeFi decentralized exchanges to new. Um, things which are which are created where you don't fully understand what it's all about um but these are like meme coins or meme tokens or fun things or um these elements and uh, probably last one last thing which also is super exciting but i have not uh, seen it in in action yet but you know it, it is something which will turn silicon valley upside down also is uh, the decentralized the decentralized web in general and web 3.0 is changing a lot of the applications uh, which we've seen. So uh, one example is next evolution of social networks. So there are decentralized social networks being built right now, which might replace uh, current Facebooks and, and Snapchats because um, the content producers are actually owning the content. It can't be manipulated or um, censored or something like that with, with all the pro and cons of, of such a system. But this is coming. And then also um, evolution of data, data storage. So imagine having a digital ID, which you actually own. And then um, if you're entering a, a club, for example, and you ask how old you, you are, then um, the, uh, let, let me explain it differently. If you go into a club, then uh, you typically ask how old you are and you have to show your full ID. But the question actually should be, are you old enough to enter? And so on the blockchain, this question could enter, could be entered and the result could be yes or no, without even disclosing how old you are or what's your date of birth. And that's the interesting part of, uh, of blockchain. So it could enable a lot of like healthcare applications where you share some parts with doctors, some not, but only the relevant ones. So and so basically this decentralized web in Burp 3.0 is revolutionizing all different kinds of industries from logistics, healthcare, data, uh, smart, da smart data, and so on. And I think that's, that's another thing where these applications are now being started. Um, but this will take some time, I guess. Sorry to put you on the spot, but I, I'm really kind of curious as you mentioned right there about, you know, the questions about, um, access to things and, and adoption. I'm wondering, uh, the metaverse, if we're all, you know, virtual reality, is that, if that catches on, do you think that crypto NFTs and that will really take off as well? Are they, able to work together or are they separate no it's all about imagination here and we as human beings can only create what we can imagine and so when we look at star wars for example star trek and all these things there are numerous examples where we are actually now building these things which some visionaries have created for us in the past we, we've seen that with Jules Verne, like travel to the moon or down the, the ocean or something like that. And now it's at Star Trek, for example, we've seen these holodecks already where you enter a metaverse 
and, and you can have like zoom meetings like we're we're having a video calls but like in person and i think that's what's becoming a reality the technology which is now with these glasses is kind of a first step but this will come this is for sure yeah so that we can like do cyber holidays or um cyber parties with with friends in in the metaverse and um, then there are also these like uh, other elements in in the metaverse, which had been reflected in Star Trek already, like uh, money. Yeah. So, for example, in some of these future uh, scientific um, science fiction movies, there hasn't been no money or like money with a fingerprint, uh, like all different kind of of uh, of evolutions. But for sure, you have not seen um, somebody pulling out some paper um, to pay. So I do, do think that the time for the metaverse is right, um, but also technology needs to catch up there a, a little bit. I've already been in the kind of a first hype of the metaverse before with 2007. We did a lot of things in Second Life on secondlife.com. We built with, with my former company, we've built um, digital environments for bank, for example, for Deutsche Bank we did and for the biggest uh, German newspaper, we did a whole digital newspaper back then and then kind of dropped down a little bit and now it's more relevant than ever, but also now the technology is much, much, much better. Uh, so we'll see a lot of good headsets coming out and these things. But bring it back to what we do is with all this innovation happening at the moment and where people dream about these things and make these visions reality, we do see a lot of new implica implications and new projects coming out. And what is fundamentally different and also turning Silicon Valley upside down is you can fund an idea by reaching out to future customers. So if you have this idea of crazy internet money or uh, a digital hospital or this metaverse or whatever, you can find a group of enthusiasts who support you and you can give them a, a digital token, which might eventually turn into a, a big value, which can be used later as a utility or it's an asset back token or has some other features around it. But you are embracing a community approach. So in the past, um, in, VCs had invested in entrepreneurs. And now what I see is VCs or investors investing in communities. And the bigger the vision, the bigger the community around such a project, the higher the chances that this will be set into practice then. Speaking of vision, what accomplishments are you looking to accomplish in 2022 and the coming years? So 2022 is for us a, a tipping point because we've seen so much development in the last couple of months uh, around adoption, uh, mass markets, and, and, and growing user base. So for us, it's about growth, traction, and um, profitability also. So uh, growth means uh, we are expanding in different jurisdictions. Uh, traction is that these users who are coming in also creating um, love our products they're using it more and more so we focus on a lot of we listen to our community we focus on things our community our users want uh, and then ov obviously also we'd like to um, uh, create good revenues and profits around it making something which is so useful that uh, it becomes a, a very profitable company so and i said it's a tipping point 2022 because we are still at the early days and i when we started out there were probably 10 million active wallets um in the crypto universe and uh, then it grew to like 30 50 million but imagine the internet with 50 million users that that's where we are right now uh, probably uh, over all the nft hype it i think we surpassed 100 million but we are below 1 billion. And I think this jump now from 100 million users to a billion will be happening in 2022. Different applications launching from WhatsApp, Novi, um, then other players, con con traditional players entering some new startups, you know, um, Twitter's uh, CEO going all in Bitcoin. These, these are all signs uh, that there's more uh, happening and a uh, transition uh, being um, 
yeah, leading to a big and exciting 2022. And Monty, for our listeners out there, what's the best way to get a hold of you? What's the best way to learn more about LCX and what your current endeavors are? So my personal Twitter account is Monty Metzger. So at Monty Metzger at Twitter, easy to find and get all the insights. But then if you want to know more about LCX, you could just visit lcx.com or follow us at LCX on Twitter as well. And uh, I'd love to welcome you all as, as new users, try, test it, get registered, and then you can be part of the next big token, which we are now launching. So in 2022, we have a, a whole lineup of new tokens being launched on our platform. So you can be part of that, but you can also join our exchange platform or the DeFi DEX aggregator called Fire Salamander. So these are the key elements which we are growing in 2022. Fantastic. We're going to have all that information in the show notes. And for our listeners out there, please connect or go on iTunes, give us a great review. Also, any other podcast platform, it encourages us to create great content like this. And check us out on the Silicon Valley Podcast.com. All our social media handles are the Silicon Valley Podcast and mine personal, Sean Flynn SV. Connect with me on LinkedIn when I'm not hosting the Silicon Valley Podcast. I'm an investment banker focused on mergers, acquisitions, growth capital, and secondaries. But please reach out to me on LinkedIn to find out what I'm up to. And if you have any questions, I'm here for you. And in, with that, Monty, I got to thank you for taking the time today to be a guest on the Silicon Valley podcast. Thanks, John. It was a pleasure.